ever get up to Goldendale in that area and you're there about lunchtime, go over to the Dirty Cowgirl to eat. Really? Yes. Okay, so I am taping now, and uh, good morning. And uh, we are now doing both live and uh, Facebook at the same time. That's a little bit why there's the difference in the background. Um, I'm standing in the sanctuary, and we have just a few of us. <laughs> but it is good to be able to both meet in person and, um, and continue to do study for people who are at home. Um, one of the things that's going to happen with this is um, when, when new people come, I'm going to give you the COVID training. And so that means that you all are going to hear this um, at the Bible study. And if you want, that becomes official that you've gone through the training and we're going to take names. And so if you are doing this live and you want to be recorded because you haven't had your name given, um, just post it and then Sean will record it. And um, and we're, we're starting with this. We're doing this because... Um, on Sunday mornings when you come, we have, a, we have a safety team, and it is growing, and it enables people to be able to come in and to worship and follow all the rules that we're supposed to be following. Um, and, um, and, and we don't expect everybody to, who's coming on Sunday morning to have to go through that training. We have that team of people to make sure everybody's doing it. But my thoughts were, when it comes to discipleship, I'll call you guys to a little bit higher level. And um, the training is quite simple. And, um, and so um, COVID-19 safety training for staff and volunteers. Uh, this training is designed to raise safety awareness about COVID-19 and will cover the following topics. What is COVID? Protect yourself and others. Church safety measures. Additional resources if you're interested. Um, this information is based upon um, what we presently know. You probably all know that, you know, science is a learning process and we're learning as we go. Um, but here we go. COVID-19 is an infectious disease caused by the recently found virus known as SARS-CoV-2 or, or coronavirus. The virus was first identified in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. And since that time, it has spread throughout the world and is now categorized as pandemic by the World Health Organization. In general, human coronaviruses are most commonly spread from infected persons to others through the air by coughing and sneezing, close personal contact, such as touching or shaking hands, touching an object or surface with the virus on it, then touching your mouth, nose, or eyes. Health experts are concerned because little is known about this new virus and it has the potential to cause severe illness and pneumonia in some people. Most people infected with COVID-19 virus will experience mild to moderate respiratory illness and recover without requiring special treatments. Older people and those with underlying medical problems like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, and cancer are more likely to develop serious illness. And this is the part where um, you know, we're encouraging people and uh, not one size fits all. Um, if you have pre-existing health conditions, um, like those described, then that should be something that you should take into account, especially there was a study that was done a, a little more than two months ago, and it was surprising. It was done actually by um, a finance group because they were thinking about their investors, so it wasn't a political issue. Um, and what they were surprised with is how uninformed Americans are. We overestimate the threat to younger people, and we under estimate the threat to older people. If you are below 50, the chances of you dying of COVID seem to be in the 0.00%. You know, it's, it's 0 0.001 or point something like that. But when you start getting to be 70 and above, then you start getting into actual percentage numbers, something like 4 to 6% of people who end up contracting COVID. And a lot of it is with pre-existing conditions. So that's the part where it's like, okay, we want people to understand not one size fits all, different risks. And, um, and then, you know, we're all grown up. You, you know the risks, you take them, you know. Um, you know, 
you could never leave your house and you could be at risk of dying. Um, so that's the part where it's just like, okay, there's different ways to respond. Um, so that is that section. Now on to the next section. That was a description. How to protect yourself and others. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have outlined the following eight key steps to prevent catching and spreading COVID-19. One, know how COVID-19 spreads. The best way to prevent illness is to avoid being exposed to this virus. The virus is thought to spread mainly from person to person between people who are in close contact with one another within about six feet through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks. These droplets can land in the mouth or noses of people who are nearby or possibly inhaled into the lungs. COVID-19 may be spread by people who are not showing symptoms. Um, there is not currently a vaccine for COVID-19. This is, again, general information. Hopefully we all know this information. Um, I'm standing behind a plexiglass shield with the idea of because my, because my mouth isn't covered, that should help protect somewhat the water droplets coming out so that you guys are in a, in a safer uh, situation if you're here in person. Wash your hands often. Hand washing is one of the best ways to protect yourself and your family from getting sick. Three, avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. Um, and this is one of the things where, you know, there's, there's an ongoing debate about, you know, just the effectiveness of masks. The masks are really geared of really trying to help people who have COVID spread it out. It's it, it, just wearing a mask does not guarantee that you won't catch it if you're around somebody who is contagious. But what ends up happening is, is that we aren't using our masks correctly and we're touching them with our hands without being washed. And then that has, a, you know, that's where if, we're, if we fall into that sort of a habit, um, probably the mask wearing is going to do nothing. It might actually increase the risk because this is the area that you touch, you and, and there you go. Um, so what you want to do is you want to wash your hands regularly and avoid touching your face. Know if you are in a category of increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19. Um, here, here is the current list of guidelines from the CDC about um, higher risk factors. People 65 years and older, people of all ages with underlying medical conditions, particularly if not well, including people with chronic lung disease or moderate or severe asthma, people who have serious heart conditions, people who are immune compromised, people with severe obesity, that would be a body mass index of 40 or higher, people with diabetes, people with chronic kidney disease undergoing dialysis, and people with liver disease. Um, Practice social distancing. Since people can spread the virus before they know they are sick, it's important to stay away from others when possible. You know, one of the things that we um, are, are feeling good about is, is that we've reopened. And, um, you know, and, and, and what we're getting is a trickle back as far as people coming um, because people are stepping into the new reality and there's the fear and, and how do we do this. Our safety measures overall, I think, are really good. Um, we actually had on our first Sunday um, somebody who came to the 9 o'clock service, and they later that day heard that their boss had COVID. They went in and got tested, and they were positive. Um, but we, um, we informed everybody who went to that service um, about the possible contamination, but we also knew that this person avoided contact with people. They did start to experience a cough during the service. And so they didn't approach anybody. And then once the service was over, they left. And, um, and it doesn't look like we had one person who was infected as this person was here. And, um, and it's because we were practicing social distancing. Um, I'll again show this to you people. We've, got, we've had some more people who have arrived. And people are sitting six feet apart. They have three chairs in between, and that's just part of living into um, these guidances. Stay home if you're sick. And this is one of the big things, um, you know, and, and this is the part where, um, so I'm, I'm actually trying out different masks because Certain types of masks that I wear, they give me a dry throat, and then I start coughing when I wear them. And um, 
It, if that was Steelers, it wouldn't do that. <laughs> Uh, J Joe said if this was Steelers, it wouldn't do that. No, it, it would probably get me sick. That's what that would do. That's exactly. But, um, it, but it happened on Sunday morning. It's just I, I was feeling, I was feeling great, and then I and then I wore my mask for like forty five minutes, and then and then I had a dry spot in my throat, and then I started to cough. And so now it's like, okay, Lord, I'm praying because I got about 15 minutes before I get up and I preach and I'm coughing. I'm by myself because I'm out in the narthex and the service is going on. But the thing is, is that, um, you know, on, on Thursday of last week, um, I, 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 I woke up in the middle of the night and I had a cough. <sighs> I had... You know, I had appointments. I had I had the run through for the sermon scheduled, and it was like I have a cough and a little bit of a sore throat. I gotta have. I'm gonna have to cancel. Um, it's the responsible thing to do. So, stay home if you're sick. Know the symptoms. People with COVID-19 have had a wide range of symptoms reported, ranging from mild symptoms to severe illness. Symptoms may appear two to 14 days after exposure to the virus. People with these symptoms or a combination of symptoms may include fever, chills, coughs, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle or body aches, headaches, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion or runny nose, nausea or vomiting, and diarrhea. And um, we're entering into the flu season, the cold season, so this is going to be inconvenient for us. But that's the part where it's like, well, it's, we're going to have to be inconvenienced a little bit. Um, seven, cover your nose and mouth with a cloth faith covering when in public. Um, cloth faith coverings can help prevent pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals from inadvertently spreading the virus to others. Um, cloth face coverings are not a substitute for social distancing because they're not going to be able to stop something getting into you. They're really to try to stop if you have it and you cough or whatever, or you breathe, that you're, you create a wider cone of infection. Uh, clean and disinfect frequent touch surfaces. So one of the things that happens is, is that when, when, when we do things here at the church, um, like having the Bible study, um, after you all leave, I'm going to go through and I'm going to wipe down all the solid surface stuff that were the, the common contact points of coming in. We don't have very many of them, and that's planned, but that's what we're doing. Um, and uh, if you need to use the bathroom, that's great, but just let me know because I'll wipe that stuff down as well. And then um, we have a fogger, um, and it uses, um, what is it, hydrogen peroxide, and it is very nifty, and we will, we will actually cl clean all the chairs, and it will be done in about a minute and a half. So, um, and, and, after, and after we've done that with the hydrogen peroxide, um, you know, the room is good to go in about 20 minutes. And so that's the part where, you know, we're, we're beginning to schedule committees, ministry teams, and discipleship opportunities. And, um, and so we're, you know, we are excited and that we can do that, even as we're going to continue. And I, and I hope you hear this, this is not double speak. We're excited that we can step into opening up and see one another. And we encourage you, one size doesn't fit all. And based upon your situation, you should make an informed decision about whether you're coming in person or continuing online. Um, okay, one, I think that we're almost done here. Um, so, Based on all that information, we, we have our church safety measures. Um, and what applies to you is that you've now gone through the training. If you come here for a non-discipleship event, um, and, ju and just realize this, we're, we'll probably be communicating this this week, if not early next week, but um, the church is not completely reopened. We don't have the doors unlocked all the time. We're still at the place where we're trying to minimize contact, especially with the office staff, because, you know, if, if you all come and you see a couple of people, and, you know, and, and wonderful, um, but if the office people see 
a couple of people now and a couple of people later, we're multiplying the number of interactions. And so we, we, we are opening the church for, for church ministry to happen, um, for committees to meet. Um, we're opening it up for groups to gather for discipleship, but the doors are not always unlocked. But now that you've had the training, if you come and it's the middle of the week, you'll come in through the side door because that's the place that we're, we typically have people enter. And there will be a little station there. You wipe your hands, you sign in, and there's a little attestation form that says, stop, I don't have a cough, I don't have a fever, I don't have these symptoms that are typical. Um, when you sign that, that means that you've, you're thinking, okay, should I be here right now? Do I have any symptoms? No, I don't. Okay, I'm good. But we do it on purpose. If you suddenly go, <clears throat> wait a second, I, I do have a cough. Or I, I've been, and then it would be okay, I should go home and then I'll call in and deal with stuff. And, um, and so we ask everybody to, in the church to wear a mask um, unless they're in a room by themselves. Um, so if you came in, and you were by yourself and you were in the library, great. But as soon as somebody comes in, the mask goes on. And, um, you know, different people have different attitudes towards these masks. And, um, you know, and, and that's the part where I want to encourage us as the church um, not to be judgmental towards each other, um, not to... Just to say, you know what, it's not that big of a deal. Um, I'm not really afraid of dying. I don't want to necessarily die. I, I think, you know, I've got good work to do. And I, you know, and I'd love to see grandkids someday. And I want to see all my kids get married and all of those things. But I'm not going to live by fear. Um, I'm going to live out of the calling. But I believe one of the things Jesus calls us to do is um, in humility, be willing to serve others. And so um, I do it because the state tells me I'm supposed to do it. And I don't think it's affecting my First Amendment rights. I do it because I got a Seahawks mask that my wife made me, and I, and I like that. Um, and I mostly do it for the sake of others to help them feel comfortable if they're, if they're in a place of either risk or concern. And um, so with that being said, you've gone through our safety training um, and uh, if, you, if you're watching online and you'd like to, to be registered that I've gone through the training because I heard all of this stuff, just give your name to Sean and we are going to put that on the list and then you won't have to go through that training again. Um, now with that, let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks and praise for today. And... Um, Lord, we, um, I give praise that you are sitting on the throne, that you have your arms wrapped around us, and, um, and all things will be well. Um, in this world, we'll have trouble. And right now, Lord, as there is uh, the contention and there was uh, some even violence and rioting last night, but a lot of the news didn't cover it. We pray, Lord, for where we are as a country um, and pray that this process of resolving the election will go forward in such a way that um, it is good and right and just, um, that there will neither be violence. Um, and Lord, if violence does arise, may it be quickly quelled and may... Um, and may, and, and may there be no real cheating. May this really be something that um, we can live into the gift of this um, republic, where it's a representative democracy, where votes get counted. Uh, we have an electoral college. Just pray, Lord, your blessings over the next number of days. Um, and Lord, I pray for the church that we would not be anxious, but in everything through prayer and petition, we would take our fears and anxieties, we would cast them upon you and keep our focus. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we're gonna 
do prayer requests at the end. And if you have a prayer request and, and you're watching live, I invite you to go ahead and send those in because that will get shared as well. <sighs> How are we doing on time? 20 after. 20 after. That's what I thought. Well, you know, there we go. <laughs> Ephesians 4. Um, we were right at verse 11. And so, um, live a life. We're in chapter 4, verse 11 of Ephesians. Um, we had been talking about um, living a life worthy of the gospel. And Paul is dealing now with this gift of unity and diversity. Um, we looked at um, Psalm 68 that Paul quotes and um, noticed that he is doing something a little bit different and probably where the one looks back to Moses in the first Exodus, this is looking forward and Paul applies it to Jesus who does the bigger Exodus. When he ascended on high, he, Jesus, led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. And, um, and, and here he's talking about our salvation and living into this idea that um, we are the body of Christ and each one of us has been given gifts for the common good. Um, let me read for you now verse 11. It was he, and this would be Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Um, now, what's interesting with this list as far as talking about the gift of the Spirit and then what the Spirit does is that oftentimes when we get this sort of discussion about the body and unity and diversity, we get identified spiritual gifts and here we focus more on people and their functions within the church. And, um, and, and we can assume that there's gifting going along where the Holy Spirit is at work and he is enabling those that he calls. In fact, that is um, one of those promises for you and I to lean on. Um, when God calls you, he will equip you. Um, and, and, and instead of focusing on, oh, there's no possible way, the answer is, is that in your own strength, you're probably right. God calls you to things that require his power and his strength. But if he calls you, rest in that call, not looking to yourself, but really looking to what God can and will do through you. Um, and so in this, this is where the part where he calls some, and um, some to be evangelists, and, um, and the idea here is people who tell the good news, who angelians, uh, people who um, announce, um, some to be apostles, some to be prophets. So there's questions that we have with this passage. Um, he's speaking into the New Testament, and, um, and it, you know, and this is the part where we have the 12, um, who were the 12 disciples of Jesus who are called apostles. We have Paul, who, be, who is named the apostle to the Gentiles. And when we speak of the 12 and we speak of Paul, we're, start, we're talking about apostolic authority, where this person um, is speaking the very words of God that are authoritative for us, especially when it comes to the written words that have been given to us, which is based on the testimony of the apostles. The word apostle just means a messenger with authority. Um, and it sometimes gets used to describe ways that people functioned in the early church. So for example, in Romans, we're told about Junia, which almost assuredly is a woman's is a woman, and she's described as an apostle. 
She's not one of the 12. Um, she, she wasn't given the same apostolic authority as, as the 12 disciples that were with Jesus who were the foundation of the church. But she was called in some way to represent the church, probably on some sort of a mission, where she was given documentation or a message that she brought to other churches, and there she was functioning as an apostle. The question becomes, what exactly does Paul mean here? And none of us can sit here and say with absolute certainty that this is what it means. It could be that Paul really is here talking about the twelve. He gave some to be the apostles, the foundations on which the church gets built. He gives some to be prophets. Now, this is another part. Um, we know that prophecy is a gift of the Spirit, that no prophet speaks the word of God without the Holy Spirit inspiring them. I'm almost quoting for you exactly what Second Peter tells us. Um, so, in one sense, you sit there and you go, apostles and prophets, and that may be, you know, like looking back to the gift of the Old Testament. But I will think, I, I, I would argue that I think this is more speaking about the gifts present in the church as Paul is writing. God calls, and he may call somebody to be a representative of the church that we send out with authority that speaks on behalf of the church. That would be an apostle. And if he has that call, he's going to equip you. Some of you may have the gift of prophecy. Now, we do know from Acts that in the early church, there were those who were known to have the gift of prophecy. We wouldn't, and it doesn't look like they were given the same status of prophets of the Old Testament as if they were writing down scriptures that became inspired or anything like that, which we normally think of. Prophecy is primarily about speaking forth God's word into the present. Most prophecy is not foretelling the future, it's forthtelling. And, and so it is altogether possible that in this church in Ephesus, they had delegates that got sent with authority, and they also had people who were identified as, as people that sometimes the Holy Spirit spoke words of truth through them, and, and those words weren't just coming from them, but were coming from God. That's what we would mean. Um, and Paul's sitting here and he's looking at this situation. He says, and all of this is given to the church for the building up of the church. Um, now, here's this tension that we fall in with this stuff. Do we have prophets today? Well, what do we mean by that? Um, there are some traditions where, you know, that they actually identify people as apostles and prophets and when they do that, they often are sitting there and they're trying to equate them of having the same authority as the 12 apostles um, who are the foundations on which the church is built. I think that's an error. Um, I wouldn't promote that way of, of looking at either reading these texts or living into um, the gift of the church. Um, and, you know, we're supposed to test prophecy. Now, I also know people who very humbly will sometimes sit there and say, you know, sometimes I feel like the Lord gives me a word and I'm going to speak it to you um, and do with it what you will, but I feel like God wanted me to tell you this. And, um, and, and, and I would want to encourage us to live into that sort of giftedness. Um, you know, hopefully we're praying, hopefully we care. And, you know, and, and this is the part where I think with humility, you sit there and you go, well, I mean, I could be wrong, but I feel like this was coming from the Lord. So I don't know exactly what it all means, but I'll just share it with you. Um, I would encourage you. I think we're supposed to live into being the church that way. Um, he gives some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists who speak the good news out to the unbelieving. Now, if you notice here, there's, there's a direction with all of these um, gifts, which, which really center around truth being proclaimed of God's word. Um, and, then, and then even moving forward, you get into pastors, people who will shepherd, and the idea is that they know the good shepherd, they're a good under shepherd, and they're going to come alongside and they're going to minister and call people to truth. We had a question. Could you clarify the difference between apostles and evangelists? 
sure. Um, so an evangelist, and uh, so the, what is the difference between an apostle and evangelist? So an apostle is somebody that, I mean, if, if we're moving to the idea that we're not talking about the 12, um, and, and I'm using the 12 here technically the way the New Testament does, that is the special designation of the foundations of the church, which were the 12 apostles that Jesus chose. Judas died. They picked one more. We don't hear much more about him, but they had the 12. And then, and then that didn't get passed on. We didn't pass on the 12. I know the Roman Catholics sit there and talk about the keys of Peter and all that stuff. And um, we could get into a fine discussion about, you know, the biblical validity of trying to pass that on to the Pope of Rome. But we've got the 12, and then we have this idea of an apostle. And in the very fact that we had apostles designated in some way, as a, in, at least in Romans, that we have examples of this where other people are called an apostle. The technical idea of apostle is a messenger and envoy sent with authority. Um, and so probably somebody representing the church on a delegation. And so, um, so let's say, for example, that Ephesus is planting churches out around the city of Ephesus, which there seems to be evidence that they were doing. And then, and then there's a question coming because they've planted a church and they're the home church. And what they've decided to do is, is that they've decided to pick Lino, Lino's here by the way, um, to be an apostle. We're gonna send you representing the church to go and deal with this situation. We lay hands on you, we anoint you in the Holy Spirit and off you go. And there is a sense that this person is mature, they know the way of God, that, that seems to be something of being able to deal foundationally with those things. That would be kind of, maybe, and this is a little bit here just guesswork. I mean, we, 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 there's a lot we don't know about how they function in the early church. An evangelist, based upon the word, is somebody who proclaims the gospel. Um, and they are proclaiming the good news that Jesus is Lord and, and this is just what the way that we use it, a message of salvation that give people the opportunity to turn and be saved. And so um, by the very fact that different words are given and we're not quite sure what it all looks like, you have to stand heavily upon the meaning of the words. And so one is a messenger with authority, another is a proclaimer of the gospel. Great question, by the way. Um, Okay. Um, some to be um, evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers. Now, again, I, that observation, all of these gifts are really people who ended up in some way ministering around the word. Um, now, now, here's these different roles, ministers, teachers, pastors, prophets, apostles. Now, these were all given to prepare God's people for works of service so the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Um, question? Yes, I did. Yeah. I didn't know we were going here, but uh, don't most of us, since the time of Jesus, would be, I should say quite a few years after that, fall into the category of evangelists, pastors, teachers, disciples? Well, the, the word disciple isn't in there. I noticed that. Yeah, because we're all disciples. Right, okay. So, so the question was coming from Joe. Since the time of Jesus, don't all of us fit into this pastors, evangelists, apostles, disciples? Teachers, yeah. Teachers. So what Paul's doing here is, is he's focusing on some specific people that have been given certain gifts within the church. But the goal here is, is that these people are given so that the entire church is equipped and gifted. And, and then it's, it's important to recognize that the word disciple isn't used in this list because a disciple it would be a broader category that would refer, 
It's, it's the most common term given in the New Testament that refers to Christians. Remember, the word Christian only appears three times in the New Testament, and it begins as a pejorative term, um, I think in, from in Antioch, um, to refer to these, little, to these little Christ followers. And so it was, it was actually a negative. But the word disciple describes every Christian. Here, this is more specific functions. Um, there becomes questions as far as, because there's a lot that we don't know about the early church, are these official offices or are they more functional in nature? Did they have an office of apostle or have an office of pastor or have an office of prophet? And my guess is, is that I don't think it would have been so formal. Though in some instances, you know, you start to have the thing where very early on, um, you start to have pastors of local congregations. Um, and, uh, you know, and depending, you know, you could use the term pastor, you could use the term episkopos, which would later get translated, uh, we use the word bishop in English to translate that idea of episkopos, which is kind of the person over an entire city. There's an interesting, um, there's an interesting um, take on all of this by a guy named Alan Hirsch. And Alan Hirsch has been influential for about the last 20 years talking towards um, equipping church leadership. And one of the things that he specifies, and, and, I, and I, I'm not in a complete agreement with his reading of the text, but I think there are some ideas to sit in, is, is that there are specific gifts that go along with these different functions. Um, and, um, you know, and, and a an apostle is, is probably a, a function w which requires a lot of leadership. It, you know, it's somebody who's willing to take charge of a situation and help wrestle it down to the ground to make itself work. Um, a prophet is probably somebody who is willing to speak the truth no matter the consequence and will hold to that conviction of truth. Um, a pastor probably is somebody who's a little bit more empathetic than the prophet. <laughs> somebody who, you know, will, you know, not, not only speak the truth, but make sure that you are loved and cared for. Um, a teacher is somebody who probably, you know, is really focusing in on God's word and is able to explain it. And, 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 and then there's the evangelist, the person who can, could go out to the non-believers and relate with them well and make sense of things. And Hirsch's observation is this, is that we expect too much if we expect any one person in the church to be all that. And um, just so you know, every once in a while, there's the feeling that when you're the lead pastor, the expectation is, is you're all that. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's like nobody can be all that. That's exactly what Paul's saying here. Some are this, some are that. And what Hirsch makes an argument for is, is that we need to release these types of gifted people, some who are a little more apostolic, some who are a little bit more of a teacher, some who are a little bit more of an evangelist, and that God has given people in the body with, with some of the gifting and characteristics of those sorts of functions, and that when we can release all of that, it will be, it will be a church that works better. And I think there's wisdom to that. Um, I think that, I don't think there is the gift of an apostle. I think it was more spot talking about a person who functioned in a certain way, but I think there's gifts that apostles have that are probably different than just the gifts that a teacher has. So, um, now, and, and that's not all the gifting and it's not all the calling. These are all given so that the whole body can be built up into the truth of the knowledge of God. Um, I thought I saw another question. Yeah, I have a comment on the, the Greek for pastor. Uh -huh. Shepherd, yeah. leader, or protector of the flock. So that's a good description of the pastor. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, so the, so the, the word for pastor is, is a Greek word that means shepherd. It's coming out of the Old Testament tradition um, of calling. And, and it wasn't just in Hebrew by the way, um, that designation for leaders to be, you know, a shepherd as a type of a leader actually was something that was present through most of the ancient Near East. 
Um, I actually have read a book on this. It was like 300 pages long of looking at every use of the term shepherd and the, and the whole metaphor for leadership. And, um, you know, and one of the things to know is, is, that, the sh is that a shepherd had to be quite resourceful. And, um, and, it, and it did become one of these things as, as a way of saying, the Lord is our shepherd. He has this sort of way towards us. Um, resourceful, um, courageous, uh, you know, and, and this is the part where well, remember David, who was the shepherd who became the shepherd of God's people, was willing to face lions and bears in order to protect his flock. Um, that's not uncommon. That's, that's, and so, um, so anyways, yeah, it is a lively image of, of kind of giving a picture and, and then, you know, you take Psalm 23 as this picture about what is the ideal shepherd who is God and then the way that we're called to be like him. And you have both the rod and the staff. And, and, and the rod is more of the stick to beat down the enemies and the staff is more of to guide the sheep who aren't the smartest of, of animals. And, um, and so you, you see this dual function of one, you, you have to be willing to be firm and you have to be willing to be courageous to face that which is evil and wrong. And you have to be gentle and kind and wise in how to lead. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Now let's focus on verse 12. God gave some in the church to be this. Why? To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Um, every one of us has a part to play. All of us are called to be on mission. It is absolutely fundamental and foundational that as you grow up in Christ, you respond to the call to serve. It's God's plan. It's his purpose. If you want to grow, serve. Um, now, you should serve the way that God calls you to serve. Um, as a church family, we're going to live into that reality. We're going to support one another. We, we have nominating committees, and they ask people to consider being deacons and elders. And when we do that, we say we want you to pray about it, and we're serious. We want this to be a call. Um, it's going to be something where when you get called to serve, it's going to grow you, which means it's going to get uncomfortable. It's going to stretch you. You're going to sit there and say, how, Lord, could this possibly be? Um, can I, can I share your guys' story with me a little bit here? So, um, so Joe and Laura, uh, sent, I, I got a letter this July and I was like really sad. You know, they're like, we're leaving the church and, and it's like, what's going on? And so I call them up and they're like, well, we're not leaving, leaving, but we need to transfer our membership because we because we've been part of Desert Air and a friend of ours called us up and the church needs help and we're feeling like this is what God's calling us to do. And I'm like, oh, well, that's totally different. Okay, so we're, we, we, we want to bless you. This is, you guys are West Siders going out. We know you're going back to your old church, but this is what God's calling you to do. And, um, you know, and we're still part of the same church body and, you know, and this is the part where, you know, we've got, we've got dual membership going on, but we're really just single membership because we're all the body of Christ. Um, but, you know, Joe and Laura are living into God's got a call. And here, here's a need, and it came to them. And they make their drive up to Desert Air, which is what, about 55 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Every Sunday? Every Sunday. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. <laughs> So, you, you know, and that's, and, uh, you know, and I, I could, I could point this out, you know, so we, we, we've got Lino and God's got a call for Lino to be involved with just looking at the whole science and Christianity and leaning into that and working with a group of people. We got uh, Pat Reich back there that God has called to be one of our elders for fellowship and she is like a powerhouse of, of love and wrapping the arms around the people and making things happen. It's just fabulous. We've got Sean that God has called to be part of the Alpha team. 
and and really leading the alpha team with Carl and taking that on. And um, and we have Bev who loves us and prays for us and we all have parts to play. Um, and I want you to be open to what God's going to call you to do. Because if you, do, if you are, you're going to grow. And, um, and this is all part of the plan. He gives some, and we're all of us in some way called to help build one another up, to prepare God's people. But these, grounding us in the truth, grounding us in the word, helping us to hear God's voice in our lives so that we, God's people, can be involved to do the works of service. And remember, this is Ephesians, which he has prepared in advance for us to do. This is grace. Um, now, he's, he's given these people to build us up, the body of Christ, that, um, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Okay, so let me just tell you how sad I was that the sermon got cut out on Sunday morning. Now, the audio version is up. I, I, I'll invite you. I don't normally do this. Listen to the audio version. Why? Because the whole sermon was about growing up in Christ. It was about being a disciple. It was about understanding how growth works. Um, it's absolutely foundational that you and I understand the call and the purpose that God has for us to grow up in Christ. We're all on the grow. We all have room. He wants to do this work. Um, and so, if, if, you, if, you didn't, if you haven't heard it, I talked about vim and I talked about chain. Vim, this is the normal pattern for any human transformation. Vision, intention, and mean. Right now, what are you living towards? What vision draws you? Where are you headed? Um, you're probably headed towards something. Now, some of us, you know, we might not be headed towards anything. That's a vision too. But God has a call on our life. And Jesus is supposed to be the dominating vision of our lives as saying, I'm living for him. And part of that call, and, and, and this is what I was talking about in the sermon, is, is we all have different calls, but there's a common call for all of us to grow up into Christ. And, and so part of that vision is to say, I'm called to be mature. And um, not everybody's called to be a parent. Not everybody's called to be married, but we're all called to grow up. But one thing that parents can testify to is one of the great tragedies of life is when growth gets stalled in our children. We don't want them to remain childish. Childlike, which in the biblical idea is not worrying about your status because you have no real status in the world. It doesn't matter what they say. Um, what matters is that you're a child of God. But we're not called to remain childish. We're called to grow up. Every one of us. So there's this vision. Jesus is calling me to follow him. And if I follow him, I'm going to grow. There's the intention. It's something that when we choose to do something over time, we slowly train ourselves to do things that we would never be able to do just on the spot. You could sit there and say, there's no possible way that I could be this sort of person that Jesus is calling us to be. Well, you're right in and of yourself. This is mostly of grace. But if you follow Jesus, he's going to release his power at work. And the closer that you follow, the more time that you spend, the more power he rubs into you, and he slowly transforms you. And so the secret of intention is you do it over and over and over. It's not a single choice. I made a decision, oh, wow, 30 years ago to follow Jesus. And I've made that decision pretty much every day since. That's what really matters, not just one time 30 years ago. But what did I do yesterday and the day before and the day before that and the day before that? The means of transformation is primarily the work of the Spirit and His power. And if you say yes to Him, He'll say yes to you and He will grow you up. But we can cooperate. Growing up in Christ is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to an attitude 
that I do it by myself. Effort, with all the strength that God so powerfully gives me. So I'm preaching a little bit of the sermon. It's still up there. Um, that's vision and tension means. And then there's chain. And it's in particular looking at this combination of the choice, decision, and tension that you have spread out over time becomes the means by which growth happens. You have a choice to make. Today, you woke up. Did you wake up in the Lord? Did you wake up saying, this day the Lord has made, I rejoice, I'm going to be glad in it, and Lord Jesus, I'm following you. Because that's what it means to grow up in Christ. It means to follow him. And so I own the choice every day. And if I do that every day, I wake up and I say, Lord, today I'm following you. That choice that I make every day becomes a habit. And it will begin to shape my life. Because it will be somewhat automatic, and this is change. Choice, habit, what becomes automatic. I go through the day and I go, I'm living for Jesus. There's a certain way that I'm going to live. And you can break this down into some specific habits that you do because you're a follower of Christ. I read God's word pretty much every day because I want to hear what he has to say for my life. I talk to him every day. And prayer is just kind of the religious way we talk about talking, but uh, I listen for him and I want to hear what he has to say. Um, I look to serve in his name. And, and these are just foundational habits, but we, we make a choice that becomes a habit and then certain things become automatic. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been talking about recently in the midst of all of the challenges that we're facing is cast your anxieties upon the Lord. You're feeling fear. Where's your focus? Is your focus on the fear or is it on Jesus? Last night was troubling, disturbing. <laughs> Nobody knows who's the president. Why does this have to continue? Okay, well, you can focus there or you can focus on Jesus has his arms wrapped around the situation that's going to be okay. I'm not sticking my head in the sand. I'm not saying there isn't any problems. I'm just not focusing on the fear. I'm focusing on Jesus. Now, that focus, as you make the choice and you build the habit, it becomes more automatic. Ooh, I'm afraid. What do I do? I turn to Jesus. And then as you turn to him, as these habits begin to just change the way. So, one of the things that I, you know, like a choice that I make is about how to deal with my anger. I, I, I came from a family that was very conflicted. You know, I mean, we, we swam in anger. You know, I mean, it was, you walked around on eggshells so that you didn't, you know, set off Mount Vesuvius. And, 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 and you, just, you just entered into that and you're just like, okay. And, um, but now I'm a Christian and, and while I had to learn how to like survive anger before becoming a Christian, it's like, no, I, I have very clear ideas that most human anger is not the lead to the righteous life that God requires. And, I, and I'm going to have a different sort of response. And, um, and so then in the midst of it, you know, it's like, okay, I know in my nature, if, if there's the difference between fight or flight, you know, some people... Are going to fight and some people are going to run. I'm a fighter. I, I, I know it. I, I, it's, but, but I'm a Christian, so I'm not going to try to do harm. I'm going to restrain, but I'm not going to try to, I don't want to, I don't want to hurt people. I'm going to think about turning the other cheek, but I realize that turning the other cheek doesn't mean being a doormat or letting somebody go and do harm to somebody else. But it means saying, okay, standing before you as a person and I'm going to treat you as a person. I rehearse all of that stuff. Why? Because it's my identity. A choice becomes a habit, becomes automatic, becomes my identity. You and I belong to the family of God. We're called to grow up in Christ. There's a certain way that our family lives, a certain way that we act. And it, it, it is completely characterized by Jesus. And then what happens as we live into this is that it becomes our nature. This is the work of God, slowly transforming our hearts so that the character of Christ becomes in us 
and we look something more like Jesus. That's what Paul's talking about in this passage, about how we grow up together, um, that we understand. And, and in fact, he's going to go here in a moment where he's going to be talking about this very picture of putting off the old life and those choices and those habits that used to form you and putting on Christ, which is this new life. Um, now, in this room, I have no clock for me. So I've got five minutes. So I'm flying blind on that sense. I, I'll fix this as far as moving forward because I had this nice little clock right in front of me in, 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 my, in my other situation as far as the office. But um, okay, so until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. There's a promise here. There's more of Christ for us. There's more life for us. As we grow up, as we mature, and, and this was the picture of David that you probably didn't get to hear. Um, it says that he became greater and greater in power, that, that God was with him. I think that was like 2 Samuel 5, around verse 11. And the picture for greater and greater was that um, he, had a large, he had a longer stride and a larger embrace. He was growing. And God wants you to grow up and he wants to give you a longer stride and a, lo a larger embrace so that you can experience more of the life that he has for you. Verse 14. As we live into this life of growing up into Christ, as we mature together, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. We won't be so much, we won't be so exposed to the lies of our society and culture that they actually affect us and impact us. Yeah. Yeah. Things are tough right now. Yeah, there, there's reasons for caution. But I'm not going to get dominated by the fear of COVID. I got Jesus. It, it, it's going to be okay. Um, appropriate caution, wisdom, you bet. But, but completely being really dominated by that? No, no. I, I'm living into a different thing. Now, here specifically, what Paul's aware of is, is that, it, let's see. Yeah, I think I, I, I've got a couple minutes, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, one of the, one of the things that's, that's before us right now in our country is the, you know, is the, is the growing acceptance of socialism. And, um, and the overall idea of socialism is, is that we're going to give more and more power to the state to control our lives. And, um, you know, and historically, you know, this is the part where I wish more people were students of history. Socialism and actual practices never worked because we human beings are, are, are flawed. And typically it becomes a way that people end up and, and we should expect this as Christians, that if you choose a socialist system and you give more and more power to the state, the state will become corrupted because it can't handle that much power. Um, so it's, it's a big concern. But the question is, why? And it's because people live in fear. And, um, you know, and, and there was this, this question that I saw that I think kind of framed it well. And there was a picture of a lion in a cage at a zoo and then a lion out on the savanna. And they, and they sat there and they said, okay, so which would you rather have? Housing and all your Medicare and live in the cage in the zoo or have to figure all that stuff out and live out in the savanna? And, and the thing is, is see that, the, the, you know, is, is that we, when we get into so much chaos and fear, we're willing to trade a lot of things for a little bit more peace. And we've got a lot of chaos and fear. And, and, 
And this is the part where we, as the body of Christ, we have to realize that there is a spiritual enemy who wants to kill, steal, and destroy people's lives. And, um, and, and, and so he's got schemes, and he's at work. And, and that choice about what type of freedom do you want or what freedoms are you willing to give so that you can have this, we all look at it and we go, it's all empty. The world can't save. Socialism can't save. Capitalism can't save. Don't hitch your wagon there. Hitch it with Jesus Christ, because all those things are empty. Now, in this, the church is going to be under attack from false teaching. And, um, and what Paul's saying is, is that as we grow up together, we will be more buffeted against that, that we will be able to discern and see what's going on a little bit more better. There's still going to be times, though, when we get shook. There's still going to be times where we get a little overwhelmed. None of us have yet arrived. But the goal is to grow, and there is a real benefit from growing because it is a real tragedy to, be, to stay stuck as an infant. So I'll end there. You kind of got a little bit of my sermon that I wanted to preach so much to you all. Um, and uh, But we were really talking about this passage of Ephesians and kind of fleshing it out. This is what he's talking about. So do we have any prayer requests? Yes. Okay. So if you so Ed DeYoung fell in the shower this morning and he is at Cadillac, so we're gonna pray for him. There was a lot of blood. In any any other prayer requests? Let's do that one first. Okay. Lord, we um, we thank you that Ed is at Cadillac and we pray, Lord, blessings for him. Protect him and secure him to life. We thank you, Lord, for um, that he and Harriet are planning a wedding to get married, and we so much rejoice in, in that news. Um, but Lord, we pray that um, uh, this little accident will just be a little accident that easily um, is healed from. So bless, keep, protect in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I would like to say a couple of things. Number one, let's start with that discipleship class we had here a couple of years ago. That has been fantastic. Good. Oh, I've used that so much. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna offer it again. Joe's uh, sharing about that we we did a discipleship training handbook and uh, how to make disciple makers, and that is gonna be something that we regularly offer as an opportunity to to really understand this. Yeah. That has been really great. The other prayer is for. <laughs> yeah, Moses did his best work after 80, Joe. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, pray for that. It, it has been coming along great. The attendance is up compared to what it was, just double. Good. And my baby sister is in the hospital. She's one had cancer two years ago. It's back. It never left, really. And she is in a room now. Nobody can go in, and it's the end. Mm. Okay. So I'm going to just pray for us and as far as for Joe, and then I'll say a closing prayer. Lord, uh, we thank you that you've called Joe and Laura to help at Desert Air, and even in their 80s, Lord, um, calling them to be stretched and to grow. And thank you, Lord, for the fruit of that call, that um, the church is flourishing. And so bless and keep we uh, thank you, Lord, that um, you give us um, you give us help in growing up, and give praise to the things that we're doing of just the discipleship training and, and opportunities that are available, and what we've already done as a church family towards those things. But finally, Lord, we lift up Joe's younger sister as she is dying, and uh, we pray for your Spirit to give both peace and comfort and hope that she would look to you, and, um, and so bless her and keep her. We lift up this day to you, Lord, and we uh, lift up our country, 
We lift up our world. We pray your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Have a great day.